But our first speaker today is Roger McKinley. Uh, they are the Challenge Director in Quantum Technologies for UK Research and Innovation. Uh, and therefore, Roger is in the perfect position to kick things off today with their overview of quantum technologies. Uh, so, Roger, if you're free to go. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Fantastic. Then please take it away. Thank you very much. OK, so uh, uh, good morning to everybody. Let me make sure I can share my screen as I've got some slides to go through. Um, and um, at the moment, it says my host has disabled the screen sharing. So I'll let... Uh, we'll see if we can get that sorted for you. Fix that. Sorry, one second. So I'll just wait for some kind of signal that I can share. Host disabled participant screen sharing still not coming up. Uh, can you try it now, perhaps? And that's great. I think we're, we're up and running. Um, I just need to see if I can find the relevant. There's always the odd glitch, isn't there? Oh, yeah, it's all good. Uh, such... At the moment, I will uh, give it another try. Hey, I think we're going. If you can see me then, Ben, um, I know I'm ready to roll. Yep, all good. I can see your screen. Excellent. So, uh, so I'm sorry about that, everybody. There's always the odd glitch, and, um, and hopefully... Um, uh, for those of you who were west of me logging in incredibly early in the morning for this, uh, it gave you a chance to, to, to shut your eyes for a few seconds and catch up on some sleep. Uh, let's talk about the technologies uh, which, when we talk about quantum generally uh, and, and, and what, it's, uh, uh, what it means. Uh, let's try and get the whole breadth of what quantum is crammed into this session and then we can actually start uh, <laughs> perhaps getting in more detail later on. And I've looked through the program, and you've got some excellent speakers coming up. I'm the Challenge Director within uh, UK Research and Innovation on what we call the Quantum Challenge. This is the industrial facing bit uh, of our activities, but it's a much broader program, the UK and Quant uh, National Quantum Technologies Program. And you've got other speakers, I think, uh, coming up in the next uh, few days who'll be covering uh, some of the other aspects. So here's a broad brush. What, what is quantum? Well, to be honest, um, let's not get too hung up on this because a lot of people don't care. They just want to use it. But it was really important for us as funders to have some kind of definition of quantum uh, 2.0 um, to make sure that our funding was going into at least some technical advances in the right area. Uh, and, and we so we wanted to exploit superposition and entanglement, uh, and, and we did in, include single photon sources and detectors as well. That was a fairly carefully worked out scope. But, but to, to be honest, everyone wants to talk about the amazing science, but just remember, if it's going to be commercially successful, the users really won't care. And uh, what they want to, to, to know is what it does for them and why it's better than the the traditional ways or the classical ways of doing things. We've got a very, very broad uh, approach. Now, this diagram, this is from David Cunner, uh, one of our innovation leads. But, but to, to, to be honest, this, this diagram has been around since 2014 on the quantum program, and it shows the, the funnel of opportunities increasing uh, as the years tick by. And we're around about in the middle of it at the moment, to be honest. So uh, atomic clocks were one of the things we, we felt were really important to include in the program. You could say it's really where people already uh, are making use of quantum effects without knowing it. So the whole business of time and synchronization. Um, network management is very much dependent on it as we go up in rates for things like 5G. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of our electricity grid is, is dependent on this for the phase control and stability. Uh, satellite navigation, every satellite has an atomic clock in it. Uh, and uh, conventional radars, uh, air traffic control, etc., all uh, are grown up applications of time. And an awful lot of it is dependent at the moment on satellite derived time from GPS. It's the cheapest way using a, 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 a network time server 
of actually getting atomic time. And it's incredibly vulnerable because GPS signals are easily interfered with. So in terms of improving resilience, um, good quality and affordable, let's talk two or three thousand dollars. Atomic clocks would really have a huge impact on the resilience of everything from comms to fintech. Gravity acceleration rotation sensors, it sounds a bit esoteric. Uh, most of you are aware of a Gravity Pioneer program actually looking at detecting buried services in construction. But there's, there, there's a, 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 a huge area here you might refer to now as alternative navigation. We've become very dependent on GNSS, uh, GPS, and it doesn't work underwater, it doesn't work in buildings, it never will. So um, quantum does through rotation sensors and accelerometers give the opportunity of giving uh, inertial navigation an upgrade. That was the technology which first introduced for jet age for transatlantic uh, navigation uh, and having smaller and better sensors which are quantum based. Uh, again, uh, significant markets being seen and all of this is market pulled. Uh, magnetic sensors for brain imaging, we'll come on to some of that, but any improvement in medical diagnostics uh, allows medical resources which are stretched to be used more effectively. The whole business of, of uh, driverless vehicles, uh, imaging, imaging as a form of guidance, imaging as the ultimate form of safety, think LIDAR, think quantum radar, uh, there are applications there. Uh, and then this business of security, quantum key distribution, which, uh, which is uh, bringing in a new age of how to distribute cryptographic keys it's not the only solution to quantum computers being able to, to crack the existing public key encryption. There are, there are various forms of quantum safe or post quantum crypt, but quantum key distribution is attracting a lot of tension with market opportunities. And then of course there's quantum computing, which everyone knows about, uh, or do they? But it's very easy when you hear the word quantum to write computing in behind it. It, it is a key application and, uh, and, and also one I've got to say, which is driving a lot of the investment at the moment. It's caught the imagination of investors. And that's quite a difficult thing to do, particularly if the big prize is still several years off and quantum computing has a few years to go yet. So let's just work through those. And I'm, I'm kind of working in order of, um, of market closeness. Uh, quantum secure communication, there's a picture of a Toshiba product there which has actually uh, come out uh, uh, from one of the projects we're currently funding, uh, which is quantum key distribution down fiber. So we are seeing real products appear, but the one which is catching a lot of uh, imagination at the moment is the idea that there could be a satellite based quantum key distribution. Uh, and that's partly a property of the physics where um, preserving quantum states in free space uh, seems to be easier than, uh, than, uh, than uh, using fiber. Uh, both obviously have commercial applications and on the key distribution side, a UK company, Arkit, uh, uh, re recently announced a significant uh, raise in funding for a planned service of quantum key, distribu uh, quantum key distribution, QKD. Imaging, again, close to market. That, that picture, which looks like uh, a CCTV camera, is a bit smarter than that. That's, uh, that is uh, uh, a methane detector uh, using quantum properties and imaging and uh, that obviously uh, has applications in terms of monitoring the release of greenhouse gases so uh, so QLM have recently announced that another product already which, which is appearing in a catalog uh, and customers can buy uh, based on quantum technologies uh, sensors and timing I've mentioned the clocks the, the rather scary picture in the middle there is a magneto uh, sensor for, for brain imaging. And, uh, and these small, but very sensitive sensors um, have the, the ability to uh, uh, enable brain imaging techniques to be used while uh, a patient is moving, which of course, if you're investigating motor issues uh, is absolutely essential and, and certain forms of epilepsy as well. So um, again, uh, topical at the moment, given that we, we realize uh, that, that good diagnostics is an essential part of, of an affordable healthcare system. And finally, the computing, and, and you know, what can't quantum computers do? But uh, the, the, the reason we always bring things like drug discovery and finance up to the top there is 
is uh, there's, there's many a man-made thing like the stock market and there's many uh, a, a wonder of nature like the way proteins fold which are existing classical computers really struggle with and uh, and to have a computer which is not only powerful but fundamentally different uh, there are significant market interests in those uh, a strong strong market pull it's not all just coming as a push from the lab most of you know about the quantum hubs which were funded back in 2014 and have been refreshed since uh, as part of a national quantum program uh, all of this was about commercialization i should say so yes there are theoreticians involved of course and there's a broad spectrum of science but the aim was commercialization and in fact each of the hubs uh, had a reserved fund uh, ring fenced to work with startup companies and industry and uh, have probably had about 100 recipients to that and one of the reasons why the quantum challenge the industrial side uh, started at, r at running pace was that so much had been done by the hubs and they continue to do good work. Flattery is a great indication of success. This model has been replicated in many, many countries uh, as a way to, to, to start the commercialization of quantum technologies. And uh, you'll see there the Oxford, Birmingham, uh, Glasgow and York hubs. The important thing also is to say they are hubs. And I, I can't remember what the figure is, but I think the, the number of universities now being uh, involved, including Bristol, um, which has had a very strong background in quantum anyway, but, but is, is well over 30. So a very strong academic network. On the industry side, the, um, the key tool we're using is collaborative R&D programs led by industry, but, but involving uh, companies, uh, involving universities. And that shows an example of one of our projects which has been running for two years which is the one I showed the picture of the Toshiba unit, also involving Kets, a Bristol company, and um, many universities, some end users like British Petroleum and British Telecom in there, National Physical Labs. Uh, so a, a really broad spectrum, and not all of it's in, in quantum key distribution. Uh, part of this project to, to look at the wider security issue included post-quantum crypt uh, with Belfast and Royal Holloway involved. So that, that gives you an indication of of the breadth where we see. So a strong, strong geographically dispersed network of hubs uh, and these, these companies, uh, as you'll see later on, um, crop up all over the UK as well. So what have we actually been doing on the national program? It, it, we're gonna have to change this slide one day because it's, um, it's gonna get uh, rather tired looking, but it is a 10 year program spending about a billion. Uh, that's for fact. And uh, it falls into two nice, not quite halves. Uh, it falls into three, but the blue bit there is for hubs and their activities running since 2014. Uh, and we're, we're over halfway through that. Um, but that activity continues and it's really important, important we continue to fund the science. Any quantum activities in the future which doesn't recognize the need to keep the science funded, I, I question. And then the orange section is the industry funded, the, the, in, in, the ISCF challenge. Uh, and, uh, and that is, is almost totally um, spoken for in all but name. By that, I mean, we've run our second round of competitions. And uh, as those are being assessed, we'll begin to know the names of the winners, but a significant amount of funding already out the door. And then a really important third bit, which is facilities and demonstrators and other activities and uh, you'll see the National Quantum Computing Center, which we're just beginning the construction of is in there, the Quantum Metrology Institute in Teddington at NPL and some other activities, DSTL sponsored around demonstrators. That's a good balanced program that represents about a hundred million of investment, public investments um, each year. So what does that mean in terms of jobs? Let's start thinking more about careers. Um, Public investment of 100 million a year of 20 million goes in facilities. Facilities really can burn up a lot of money, which is not core to the technology. So let's put that aside and be a bit cruel on ourselves. That leaves about 80 million funding per year to go on collaborative projects and the, the commercialization research of the hubs. Uh, and I'm going to say that it's easy to actually push 30 percent of that into material spend or, or facilities as well. So, so what's left, you know, 56 million a year is, is actually 
in, in the way most companies would work, uh, probably worth about 600 jobs uh, if you can keep that funding level up. Now that doesn't sound very much, but that ignores the fact that the funding on the industry side is catalytic. And uh, that is in fact seeding and encouraging private investment far faster than we realize. So the recent ARCIT announcement raising $400 million, we've had similar announcements of scale um, in the US uh, on INQ. We, we've had um, uh, UK companies like Cambridge Quantum Computing uh, 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 and River Lane announcing uh, raises recently. So there's a lot happening in the world of private finance. Uh, and if that rate continues, we're talking about significantly more jobs being created. Plus, I think the public sector spend is going to have to increase, and that's not stating policy. Um, it's not, it's not uh, making an announcement. It's just saying that if you see some of the newcomers to quantum, like France, for example, um, the, the levels governments are announcing it is beginning to come above 100 million a year. And that's in recognition of just how difficult computing is. So the size of the task is beginning to become apparent. Let's move on, as I wanted to, to finish with, with, with about 10 to 15 minutes to spare for, um, for questions. Um, where are the careers? Well, one of the things which you have to get used to as you, as you start moving to commercialization is when you're a quantum physicist, everything is about the quantum bit, the qubits if it's a computer or the sensor. Uh, if it's a sensor. Uh, and um, you tend to think, well, there's going to have to be some other stuff to make that work. The middle diagram there says actually, and in fact, Google showed this, um, there's an awful lot of other stuff. And if you could imagine a quantum computer being a bit like a nuclear reactor with a quantum -y bit as a little cube in the middle, then the other stuff is enormous. And it's uh, a whole range of engineering disciplines, cryogenics, microwave and RF, photonics, single photon sources, detectors, magnetics, optics, integrated optronics, software. Um, it's all in there. And I think the important thing to realize is none of that at the moment is quite good enough to make the quantum physics work. In other words, there are huge engineering challenges about actually getting quantum states to, to be controlled in the right way and getting the sensor or the computer or the imager to do the job it's intended. Finally, of course, products live in the context of companies, uh, other product portfolios, standardization. And that diagram on the right shows there's an awful lot you have to wrap around a product before you can be in the business of actually selling product and supporting product. So uh, there's a lot more to this than just for science. Um, but of course, without the science, none of this will happen. So what does this mean? Let's uh, think a little bit about what we've just been funding. Last year, we, we put out 75 million of grants um, on about 40 projects. And I'll take you through a few of those. That, those involve 84 business and 29 universities. So if you're looking for a career, there's quite a few institutions. Actually, 170 odd companies and 40 universities applied for funding. So, so this is becoming quite an quite a encouraging area in terms of the sheer diversity of organizations and their locations of those who are involved in quantum at the moment. And we've just run another round of competitions and the story is very similar. A few slides on projects just to make the point. Uh, Kairos is a clock project led by Teledyne E2V. Uh, so that's really looking at a commercial product. Right at the beginning, I mentioned the importance of, of chip scale clocks clocks costing a few thousand dollars rather than $25,000. And you'll see the companies involved in that and the organizations involved in that. Uh, and, and they span device level technologies, compound semiconductor center, universities, uh, and um, packaging or, uh, companies, uh, a defense company there, Leonardo. So a huge range of uh, companies involved. And you could say you're getting a hint here. It's as much about the application as it is about the technology. And the art here is marrying the technology with the application. Our kit I've mentioned, um, it's really, really important to realize that I'd say if you want a career in quantum, master two areas because the interfaces are everything. And I don't mean interfaces in terms of pins on a connector. I mean interfaces in terms of uh, where two technologies meet. If I'm going to build a telescope to, to get quantum keys from space, 
how much of it's in the optics and the glass, how much in the coating, how much in the single photon detector, how much in the software behind that, how much in the overall package and the environmental control of it, how much in the value engineering and getting it to cost the right level to, to, to make there be a market. All of that has to be looked at. Um, I would say be master in two of those areas. Um, master more than two if you can, because it's the systems engineers and the architects which will be needed to create these products and the services around them. Uh, QLM I've mentioned with a gas detector, National Grid in there uh, with a potential interest, Bay Photonics, another photonics company, BP as a huge user. Uh, uh, so again, interesting range of companies. Uh, here's a quantum sensor, a magnetic sensor for end of line uh, lithium battery testing. Some slightly different people involved there. Kelvin Nano up, up in uh, Glasgow for the, uh, for the the actual fabrication of the devices, magnetic shields limited, obviously why they're involved. So you'll see a slightly different application, but all of this brings up that same system engineering and architecture issue. Uh, you need integrated teams, but you need also into, uh, people who understand the science, the engineering, and are happy to, to wade into more than one area of expertise. High Bias 2 is a navigation product uh, uh, project looking at quantum navigation. Cold Quanta is an American company with a UK subsidiary. So that reminds us about uh, you know, foreign direct investment and the fact that UK is looking attractive for other companies to invest. Oxford Quantum Circuits on the computing side. Uh, again, an interesting mix. Seek, you can see in there as well, University of Glasgow. And um, when you flip back round to the uh, uh, River Lane, which is looking at an operating system, you can see just how many different uh, forms of um, uh, or different individual uh, companies are being uh, consulted on that. Uh, Oxford Ionics, Hitachi, uh, Arm, Seek again. Uh, and so there in this business, of course, you need to be master of more than one technology for the core platform. So um, there's a tremendous message here of the need of being breadth. So it's about science as well as engineering but there's an awful lot of engineering to do. What you might call control engineering has got to be taken to new heights in terms of uh, the microwave or the optic elements of that. There's a lot of systems engineering, a lot of software and applications, both in terms of the stack of a quantum computer, but also matching uh, applications to, uh, to, to the machines themselves. You'll find certain banks with teams of 20 uh, quantum people um, because it, it's like computing was in the 1950s, you need to understand the technology. And finally, it's disruptive, which means the Intels and the Motorola's and the ARMs and the IBM's and the Microsoft's who came to, uh, to great places in, in, in classical computing may be replaced by others. So you could be in a position of finding yourself in a very small company, which one day becomes a household name like that. And I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you very much for that, Roger. Fantastic talk. Um, I think, well, yeah, we've got uh, quite uh, a few moments for some questions. So potentially as chair, uh, I'll take the opportunity to ask the first one, if that's okay. Um, which uh, of the quantum technologies, and perhaps this is maybe not such an answerable question, but which quantum technology do you think will see widespread adoption first? Are there, are there any promising candidates uh, that you're well, we're, yeah, we're seeing we're seeing the the communications and the um, communications and the the sensing, as I mentioned, in two products getting to market first. Um, but that's almost that's that, that's answered the product question. If there is something which looks like um, it's going to be in pretty well every serious quantum computer, no matter what the qubits, I'd say ju just at the moment, if you take your computer to bits. Uh, you, you'll get um, you'll, you'll get inundated with ribbon cables. I think the quantum computers are going to have to have a lot of light in them. So optronics, uh, integrated optronics, uh, because uh, in terms of being able to, uh, when you think quantum memories, when you think uh, controlling quantum states, uh, replicating quantum states, quantum repeaters in comms, the, the world of photons is looking really important. So there's two answers there. There is some stuff close to market. But if you're in the quantum business and you know about font photonics, I think you've got a job, I think. Oh, potentially good news for us at Bristol. <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks for that, Roger. Um, so from someone in the Q&A session, uh, are there plans to create engineering apprenticeship programs tailored for the quantum tech industry, uh, as opposed to focusing solely on PhD or MSc programs? I think yes is the answer. I think it's really important that it's done um, in consultation with industry. Um, but I would be careful about the word Q. I mean, uh, people in the training business have to stay in business by, by being very current. And there's going to be a tendency to write a Q in front of every course to say now it's a quantum course, you know, report writing for quantum scientists. You know, um, I, I would be I would say that where we're going to have acute shortages and need those apprentice and technician skills is in the fabrication side and some of those very hardware technologies. And just remember, if you go to someone like uh, Kelvin Nano or James Watt uh, in Glasgow, um, if you are trying to build something on a wafer, then the person helping you at the machine won't be able to do their job without at least 18 months of experience. So that technician support is really difficult support. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. Apprentices and such, ships and so on need to be being considered. And it's take, we're, we're having a very hard look at that at the moment. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from Thomas Clark. Really loved your concise overview with loads of stats and good advice. Given the various hardware platforms of quantum computing, what are your thoughts on the less focused on models of computing, in particular photonics based, of which smaller companies in the UK are pioneering? I think at, at the moment, the jury, put it this way, it's too easy to back, a, it's too, too soon to back a winner. And it's too easy to, to start um, making predictions. Um, one thing is we there's no evidence there's going to be a single universal platform in the world of um, uh, of quantum. That is to say that some platforms may be better at certain applications uh, than others. Um, there's a lot of focus on NISC uh, platforms at the moment as a good intermediate stage, but but that's. Um, even that, I think some some would question. And of course, we're seeing some some real grown up use of of um, of the adiabatic machines uh, at the moment as well. You know, and, and for for single variate uh, problems. So I, I would um, I'd be incredibly cautious about backing um, winners at the moment. But I, I do think um, well, let, let, let's let's fudge the answer. Maybe it's back in this hybridization of skills. Maybe if you only know about photonics, you're not going to get a core quantum computer. And if you only know about superconducting, you're not going to get there. Uh, but you've got to understand uh, the real nature of an interface. And then you've got to be able to do that at scale. So integrated photonics and integration between technology types is going to be the real key. And you know what? There's always been a shortage of people who can do that kind of thing. And, and creating the right sort of people who've got a grasp of the fundamentals and can span these disciplines is where success is going to lie. Yes, yeah, so we're all very much going to have to work together. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so we've got a question from uh, Shradanjali. Apologies for the pronunciation. Uh, do theoretical PhDs in quantum communications have any chance uh, of getting hired in these quantum technology companies uh, in terms of uh, the skills that are in demand? I think anyone who can think stands a strong risk of getting hired. Just just remember, if you're a, a company like uh, Oxford Quantum Circuits or River Lane or any of the companies we've talked about, Arkit, who are growing, um, what you actually want is people who are not frightened of quantum or who don't just kind of worship it as this strange and spooky science, but know how to roll up their sleeves and start doing stuff. And they're desperate for people uh, and they're having to invent their own rules in terms of who's going to be useful in their organization. And, um, and I think the communications world and the quantum computing world are going to be very close um, friends over the next few years. Uh, one person's motherboard is another person's transatlantic link. You know, one person's memory is another person's repeater. Um, just think of data center architectures, for example, and optical communication within. So, yes, it's a simple answer. I'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. <laughs> uh, I think we've got time for a couple more questions, um, potentially one from us, actually. Um, question from Alex Q. Uh, we've got, which are the most competitive countries in the world for quantum? And uh, are there potentially surprise any surprising up-and-comers that you're aware of? 
Well, we, we really need to know a bit more about what China's doing because quantum's difficult and expensive. And if you've if, if you've got government prepared to put a lot of state funding in, and you've got a lot of well-educated people, you're going to do quite well with quantum. Um, the US is spending a lot of money. We know that. We used to say the UK was third, and um, and uh, I think we. I mean, I think we could still hold our heads high and say we're doing pretty well. Um, but a bit like the Industrial Revolution, it's going to not just take the science and the ability to invest. It's going to have to land, if you like, into fertile soil. And I'm very optimistic about the UK, to use a, an analogy, which is always dangerous, which is, you know, the um, there are not many mighty oaks in quantum in the UK. We don't have the big tech companies, which means that all the rain and sunlight reaches the forest floor. So I think the UK at the moment, and the investment figures are showing this, looks like having some really good conditions under which a lot of good companies are going to emerge and possibly some of the very big ones who dominate the industry in the future. And certainly that's what I would like to see. Definitely, that's a great analogy. Uh, hopefully, yeah, we can uh, reach up through to more of the uh, bigger companies and uh, see some of those UK companies getting through to them. Um, we've got another question from uh, Rigel. Uh, what kind of profiles do companies at the moment look to hire? Do you know, I guess maybe quite a broad question, but if you have any uh, particular ones in mind. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, the software companies and so on will be looking for people who, um, who, who've got the, the, the right experience in terms of some quantum experience or a mathematical background. Uh, look on the websites is the answer. The hardware companies are, have got a much bigger issue in terms of, of just the sheer cost of, of, of getting fabrication and scale up going. And, and there's probably a much broader spectrum there, but, um, you, you know, when a technology is new, it's very difficult to de-skill. In fact, one of the jobs and, and a lot of engineers spend their time doing is stopping engineers trying to make product um, and, and getting it into a repeatable or, or an automated form of manufacture, which means that people who earn a bit less can put it together and therefore it's affordable. So you are going to see at the moment, as you will with any technology, a real demand for some very, very good people who can think straight and sort this out. And they will be the enablers for a whole range of other skills to follow. But the, the answer is um, companies who are trying to grow and are raising funding and desperate to get the right people. Um, well, all of the websites say the same. You know, they're saying we're looking for good people, contact us. And, and then the trick is, probably the most important trick is not to sit there saying, I've got to tell this company everything I know. It is to understand their business model and to see where you can add value. And that's true of any, any career. And it's really true at the start of a technology. So look at your own skills and say, where could I add value to a company like that? Definitely, so really targeting yourself where you want, where you think you, know, you, you apply for. It's great. it's great, later on when things are more mature, everyone says, I ought to work for that company. They've got lots of people like me. For a small company, don't work for a company who's got lots of people like you, they won't want you. Look for, yeah. people, look for people who are not like you, look for a company which hasn't got people like you. <laughs> Definitely looking to stand out rather than fit in for sure. Uh, I think maybe we've got time for one final question uh, from Asif Shah. And uh, what are your views on solid state qubits like using diamond color defects for qubits? Uh, and are they scalable in the near future? Uh, and there's quite a lot more to that question, but maybe we can- Well, yeah, I mean, di diamond's still in there. I, th I think the answer is we've got to keep open-minded. Um, I think uh, the silicon world is doing some really interesting stuff at the moment, but you see, you've got to get beyond the marketing speak. Um, you know, the, if, if, your, if your speech goes like this, we've invested billions and billions on the planet on silicon. We can make silicon wafers. Therefore, we've got to find a way of, uh, of making uh, quantum work at room temperature on silicon. Well, actually, there's a good logic in that. But what if it's not possible? <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas, you know, the, uh, the, the other way of looking at it is we've really got to get to grips with the science. And we've also got to be led by where the commercial opportunities are going to be. And you've got to have a meeting of minds. Both of those are rather caricature views. Um, again, while you're talking careers, you know what's absolute gold dust at the moment? Uh, be they scientists or engineers, people who know the difference between what is really difficult, which could actually, if you crack it, make you rich, and what is impossible, 
which uh, will, will be the start of a long career of achieving nothing. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and that's why you, you need people who, uh, the, you need the theoreticians, you need the mathematicians, you need the deep physicists, as well as the engineers to crack these issues. Um, and there are shortcomings in all of these, but, um, but, you know, we are going to need quantum memories in the future. We're also going to need quantum repeaters. And there's more than one animal out there, and there may well indeed be more than one computer out there, family out there in the future too. Definitely. Well, uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time, Roger, and thank you very much for taking the time to answer all of these questions. Uh, I'm sure it's very much appreciated and we've loved having you here today. Um, if there are any remaining questions, we'll move them over to the relevant Slack channel, uh, where if you would like to um, maybe take a moment to browse through those and see if there are, there are any more that you can answer.